First, I'd like to thank uh, Ed Foster, Christopher Soilosano, and Michael Franco for inviting me here to read. I'm going to be going to read uh, uh, some uh, translations and some of my uh, original poems. The first is by Philostratus the Elder, who was a Greek who lived in the 4th century AD, and he wrote a book where he described paintings to a young man. Here he describes Palestra, the goddess of wrestling. Now here is Palestra. Look at her. If you try to compare her to a boy, you will see she is too feminine. And yet if you compare her to a girl, you will see that she is too manly. She wears her hair too short to even be braided. Her eyes may be either those of a man or a woman. And the scornful expression on her face indicates that she has no interest in lovers or wrestlers. She is certain that she can resist the one as well as the other. And she is certain that she will so excel in the contest that no man will ever be able to graze her breasts. And her breasts are seemingly underdeveloped and no larger than those of a young boy. She has no interest in feminine things. Indeed, she does not care if her arms are white as snow and shows her disapproval of the dryad since they spend hours in the shade so as not to darken their body. Indeed, well aware that Helios dwells in the hills and vales of Arcadia, she implores him to tan her body, to give it color, and he obliges her. As if he were giving her a flower, so too does he redden her body with moderate heat. And the painter shows his skill in painting the shadows that play on the young girl who is seated. And indeed, her posture in this position is flattering. And the olive branch across her bare breasts is also becoming to her. Palestra is very fond of this tree, since men use its oil in wrestling, and they derive great pleasure from it. And so does she, just as though she were one of them. Now I'm going to read a series of uh, poems that I titled Inventions on Ancient Themes. One, dust scatters in the late afternoon wind. The sea boils over. Suddenly a false god appears on the waves. The captain thinks to transcend himself, searching for fool's gold in a Cyprian boat. O oh, luckless sailor, why risk these treacherous waves? Do you think you know better than a god how Fortuna deals with reckless sailors? Better even than this god, who tests your prowess now, and will trick you into believing the golden mirage is real as he tosses your boat onto the rocks? Turn back, go no further, lest you anger the god more, or you will soon wake up in Hades, a broken man, wandering aimlessly among the dead. Three, Ilya, spirit of the Tiber, has been, in, has been violated. As a result, our children have become our enemies, cursed their fathers and raped their mothers. The streets are no longer safe. Young men hide in dark alleyways, awaiting their victim, a bloody knife held in their filthy hands. Their eyes blaze through the black night. There has been no sun for a hundred days. Apollo, you who see far into the future, save us, I beg you. The prophecies speak of strange diseases to come, infecting the entire earth of madness and death from a thousand plagues. Help us, please, otherwise all men and women will have to suffer the punishment of Zeus without end. 10. Let's drink by the hearth, the hearth, and leave all our sorrows to the gods. They can provoke the winds on the boiling sea, bring mighty civilizations to utter ruin as they please. I don't care, not if you're near me. So come kiss my lips, dear boy. Do not think of tomorrow. Death lurks around every corner for those who think like you or I, who pursue pleasures not known to ordinary men. 35. What can I, a poet, ask of a god? Nothing. 
except that I may never take for granted the, thing, the things I have, though they do not amount to much, that I might preserve my sanity and health, so that I may live a long life in peace. What can I, a poet, ask of a god? No more than this. 33. If Icius, I can see you love this sweet-scented boy of the Arabian palace. You are seduced by these jewels and rare gems that are strewn about his bedroom and that hang from his thin neck and his exquisite scent and his deep red lips and his blue radiant eyes. But beware, the gods say you will meet your death at his hands. Okay, now I'm going to read uh, from my translation of Gerard de Nerval's The Chimeras, uh, the second part, The Christ in the Olive Groves. It uh, opens with a quote by John Paul Richter. God is dead. The sky is empty. Cry, children. You no longer have a father. One. When the Lord lifted up his frail arms to heaven beneath the sacred trees as poets do, he had suffered in silence for a long time and believed himself betrayed by ungrateful friends. He turned to those waiting for him down below who dreamed of being kings, wise men, prophets. But they were numb, lost in the sleep of beasts. And he began to shout, No, God does not exist. But they slept. My friends, have you not heard the news? I defied God to give me proof of his presence in the eternal vault, and because of that, I am a broken man, bloodstained, destined to suffer. Brothers, I have deceived you. Abyss, 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 there is no God on the altar where I am the victim. There is no God. God does not exist. But they were still sound asleep. Two. He began again. All is dead. I have traveled between the worlds. I lost my sense of orientation in their milky ways to such an extent that life from its fertile veins no longer pours out the golden sands and silver waves. Everywhere I looked, I saw a wasteland surrounded by waves, disturbed hurricanes from restless oceans. A vague breath influences the motion of the wandering spheres, but no spirit exists in these immense regions of space. Looking for the eye of God, I saw only a single eye, vast, black, and bottomless, and the darkness from within radiates out into the world, growing ever darker. Looking, a strange rainbow surrounds this somber pit, threshold of the old chaos whose shadow is nothingness, spiral that engulfs the worlds and the days. Three, immobile destiny, standing silent watch, cold necessity, as fate advances among the dead worlds under the eternal snow and freezes gradually the dying universe. What are you going to do, primordial power, with your extinguished suns, one collapsing upon another? Are you sure you are able to transmit an immortal breath between a world that dies and one that is being reborn? Oh, my father, is it you that I feel inside myself? Are you alive or are you defenseless against death? Have you succumbed during a final reckoning with this dark angel eternally condemned? Because I sense that I am alone in my weeping and suffering. Alas, if I die, everything will die. Four. No one heard the eternal victim moan, who gave to the world in vain all the outpourings of his heart. But dizzy with exhaustion and almost lacking the strength to speak, he called upon the one who was alone, but awake in Jerusalem. Judas, he cried, you know how they value me. So hurry, sell me off, be done with all this bargaining. I am suffering, friend, thrown to the ground and beaten. Come to me. You, who at least have been emboldened by crime. But Judas departed, discontented and deep in thought, finding that he was poorly paid. 
and so full of intense remorse that he read the account of all his crimes written on every wall. At last, only Pilate, who kept the careful watch over Caesar, feeling some pity, averted his eyes. Bring this madman to me, he said to his aides. Five. It was him, this madman, this sublime fool, this forgotten Icarus who flew too close to the sun, this Phaeton destroyed by the lightning of the gods, this beautiful Addis emasculated whom Sibylle revives. The augur examined the wound on the victim side. The earth was getting drunk with this precious blood of Christ. The dizzy universe was unsteady on its axes, and Olympus for an instant, instant staggered toward the abyss. Answer, cried Caesar to Jupiter Ammon, what is this new god being imposed upon the earth? And if it is not a god, it must be a demon. But the oracle invoked had to be silent forever. There was only one who could explain this mystery to the world, the hidden god who gave his soul to the children of clay.